SI News, where the focus is you. This is Good Morning San Diego. Good morning, San Diego, and thank you for being with us on this Tuesday, July 30th. Welcome to Good Morning San Diego. Let's go ahead and take a live look outside as it, we are starting to kick off the day here. 5 a.m. Looking pretty nice. Diane will be in with a look at our forecast in just a bit. But we do begin this morning with a man having been shot and killed by a homeowner after attempting to rob the property. Police say shortly after 7 Monday night on the 41,000 block of Diamond Circle, a homeowner who was in the house with his wife at the time confronted a man who broke into their home using a rock and a stick. Police say that's when the homeowner and ended up shooting the robber three times with one bullet striking the man in the chest. When officers arrived just minutes later, the man was pronounced dead despite attempted life-saving measures. An investigation into the shooting is now underway. Two 15-year-old boys who were arrested earlier this year in connection with a deadly shooting in Chula Vista made an appearance in juvenile court yesterday. Investigators say they have reason to believe the shootings were cartel-related and not random attacks. The shooting occurred last March with one outside a restaurant in Chula Vista and the second hours later at an apartment complex in Otay Ranch, leaving one person dead and another injured. During yesterday's hearing, prosecutors brought a motion to dismiss the case against the minors deferring prosecution to the U.S. Attorney's Office. D.A. Summer Steffen released this statement saying in part, quote, the referral for federal prosecution in this case aims to stop the recruitment of minors to execute violent crimes. San Diego will remain committed to strong collaboration between our courageous federal, state, and local partners to keep our community safe and to not permit these violent acts to occur in our local neighborhoods. Well, after eight months, a 76-year-old woman has received her sentence for her involvement in a deadly North Park hit and run. Donna Jacobs was sentenced to two years probation for a hit and run from last November that took the life of 42-year-old Stephen DeBeau. The crash happened at a busy North Park intersection where residents had been pleading with the city to put up a stop sign. Police say Jacobs was driving 30 miles per hour when she hit DeBeau in an unmarked crosswalk and continued to drive for 65 feet with him on the roof of her car. DeBeau suffered multiple injuries and died at the hospital six days later. Stephen was a great pillar to our community as a great human being and he will be forever lost for us. And this lady has no remorse or care. The judge granted Jacobs two years of formal probation. In addition to the two years of probation, the court imposed 365 days of local custody that she is authorized to serve through CPAC, an electronic monitoring system that would allow her to stay at home. If she violates that probation, she could go to prison for up to two years. And part of the terms are that she is not to operate a motor vehicle. The El Cajon Police Department is seeing a rise in theft throughout their city. This comes as the department has reported that thefts under $400 in value have risen nearly 60% through the first half of this year compared to last. And all theft-related crimes rose by 30% in that same period. Officials say, however, that this might not necessarily mean more crimes are being committed, but rather more are being reported. This comes as a citywide effort it encourages retailers to report all thefts to the police department as part of a new focus on theft enforcement and investigation. Migrant encounters along our southern border may be down, but border officials are ramping up efforts and preparing for a rise as we inch closer to the election. Some border officials are raising concerns that calls for the U.S. to increase security at our borders and even questioning the timing of President Joe Biden's executive order that cracked down on the asylum loophole. But some lawmakers, like immigration attorney Esther Valdez-Clayton, say the timing was strategically planned. 
Yeah. It's under 100 days. The Biden administration is getting heat and saying, why didn't you clamp down sooner when they could have all along? But it's a trifecta of great conditions, all of which we mentioned. The weather conditions this summer, astronomically high. The Mexico clamp down as well. And also Kamala Harris, now that she is the presidential candidate, she's stepping into more of that diplomacy. We're gonna keep, continue to see greater numbers here in San Diego, more headlines, and just this last fiscal year, 93 individuals from the terror watch list have been apprehended here in San Diego. As of now, numbers are down 55% following the implementation of new asylum restrictions. Meanwhile, local border agents are installing a second border wall in an effort to stop the flow of fentanyl into the United States. U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents working in the El Centro sector have built a second border wall to reinforce the original wall. Officials say the El Centro sector is dealing with 25% of all the fentanyl seized between ports of entry. Border officials say the secondary fence was created out of the materials owned by the federal government that were simply gathering dust. But the Sinaloa cartel, which is operational on the opposite side of the border, is aware of the measures as agents are already finding border bars being cut through throughout the sector. Well, researchers at San Diego State University are taking matters into their own hands to understand the depth of the Tijuana sewage crisis. They began studying the water in the area to test how contaminated it is and how harmful it can be. Salvador Rivera brings us the latest. Alex Grant spent her Monday morning in an area most people would avoid at all costs, the Tijuana River Valley. I'm with the San Diego State Water Innovation and Reuse Lab. We come out about once a month or so to um, take water quality samples. This particular event, we are just sampling from one location over the course of four hours to see how the wastewater uh, profile or the water profile of the river water uh, changes over time. The last event that we did, we actually sampled from 13 different locations throughout the estuary from the border to where the estuary outlets into the Pacific Ocean. Even during dry conditions like now where we don't have any rain, you have constant flow of uh, water coming across the border um, through the Tijuana River. Much of that water is very polluted and if you were here to smell it, it smells like like sewage. The water samples have failed the smell test, but further research will be done. Today, we're, we set up a little field station here where we're taking some real-time measurements. We also have sensors deployed throughout the estuary that are getting real-time measurements that we can look at all the time. And we're also going to take the samples back to our lab at San Diego State University later for water quality parameters, such as bacteria like E. coli and Enterococcus, total dissolved nitrogen, and dissolved organic carbon, uh, turbidity, all of these things that help us determine uh, how clean or how uh, polluted the water here is. Grant says prior studies have found the water in the Tijuana River Valley is heavily contaminated. Our hope is that with this research, we can help move the needle by informing uh, decision makers with more information about the status of the water quality and also engage with the public in order to try to make some improvements here. The results from samples gathered by Grant and her fellow researchers this week will likely be published next year. Salvador Rivera, Border Report. Salvador, thank you. Well, a magnitude 4.9 earthquake followed by several strong aftershocks were felt across Southern California early Monday afternoon. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, it struck around 1 p.m., about 13 miles outside the city of Barstow. Initially, it was measured as a 5.1, but was quickly downgraded. It was followed by several aftershocks measuring 3.5 and 2.7. The impact could be felt as far away as the city of Los Angeles. There have been no reports of any damage or injuries, thankfully. San Diego area firefighters have been deployed to help with the massive park fire burning in Northern California, which is now among the largest in state history. The park fire burning north of the city of Chico has now incinerated more than 370,000 acres 
and is just 14% contained. That's an area larger than the entire city of Los Angeles. The fire has already destroyed more than 100 structures. One evacuee we spoke to loaded her seven dogs into her car and got them out just in time. Whatever we had can be replaced, but I wouldn't have left the animals at all. Uh. Officials say the fire was started by a man seen pushing a, uh, a car that was on fire into a ravine. He is now behind bars accused of arson. In the meantime, thousands have been evacuated as nearly 5,000 fire personnel are battling the flames in remote and difficult terrain. It is now the sixth largest fire in state history. Meanwhile, closer to us, the Nixon fire in Riverside County has evacuees heading to Temecula. The wildfire started around 1230 yesterday afternoon northeast of Palomar Mountain in Aguanga near Tool Valley Road and Richard Nixon Boulevard. The fire has scorched through 2,700 acres already. Residents and businesses in the surrounding areas have been told they may need to leave. An evacuation center has been set up at Temecula High School for both people and pets. The cause of that fire is still under investigation. All right, let's get a check of our weather. As we know, Diane, that plays a critical role in battling these fires, which Absolutely. is uh, just hard to see. I know, yeah, and yesterday we had a little bit of the wind speeds pick up in the afternoon hours. Today, Lauren, they're gonna get a little bit more aggressive, but also we are getting some humidity levels increasing as we get through the rest of the work week too. But in accordance to that, we're also gonna get a lot of the warm temperatures back in some of our areas. So the desert and the mountains and then the inland valley locations will also increase their daytime highs as well as getting some humid air and moisture into the forecast. So it's kind of the play of both worlds where you have enough of the wind speeds to settle down in the first half of your week, which we started off with. And now we're getting an influx of some of the moisture from the monsoonal flow in the back end. But we also have another heat uh, wave pattern coming our way, which will be a gradual effect, which is good news. But overall, we're still dealing with uh, excessive warnings and watches when it comes to the wind gusts and then adding some heat. They're not in effect yet, but we'll keep an eye on things as we get uh, into the second half of your week as these temperatures start increasing. They really start well, increasing Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, Sunday. But for now and tomorrow, we'll have another day of somewhat of a cool down, right? It's a nice little pause to the heat before we ramp things up yet again. And as we saw yesterday, a lot of the saturation we got briefly has already been dried up once the sun came up in the afternoon hours. Cloud visibility you see there uh, limited to the coastline, but some of the low clouds are pushing into Inland Valley locations as well. We're going to have the same pattern, same routine with the patchiness of the fog along the coast for another day or so until we get some of that high pressure system uh, traveling south so we can clear that up in your morning hours. Until then, your current conditions, 67 degrees right now at the beach, mix of high uh, clouds and low clouds this morning, just like yesterday. The winds again starting off fairly light, northeast winds at five miles an hour, but then when you get to 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock this morning, you'll notice a little bit more of the push from the sea breeze direction, so onshore flow that will then carry through in some inland valley neighborhoods. But nonetheless, at least it's not going to be this aggressive pr approach where you have 45 to 50 mile per hour wind gusts clocking out this early uh, in the day. They'll get it in the afternoon. That's over the mountains and deserts, and I'll show you that in just a few seconds. But other than that, we'll just have to maintain the cool air, take advantage of that, and also um, as quickly as the humid uh, moisture in our atmosphere comes in, which you'll see here from the desert southwest, coming in from the south, right over Tucson, Phoenix, then landing in our area right around Wednesday, Thursday, which is why our cool down ends there. And then we add a little moisture, you add the hot air mass, it's just gonna feel that mugging and stickiness that you get. We noticed, uh, if you notice the, the green area in our region, and then a little bit of hint of yellow, that means chances of thunderstorm activity in our mountains and deserts. So we're looking about 30, 35 to 40%, and that's for Thursday into Friday. And then anything else, would be just carrying through any moisture from the back end. But for the most part, we're looking at wind staying pretty calm and pretty consistent for the morning anyway. If you look at the onshore flow, we're looking about three mile per hour wind speeds to five at the most. Uh, later on in the afternoon, if you look at places Julian and Mount Laguna, those areas in Baraga Springs will increase theirs to about 15 to 20. So those are the areas that we need to keep an eye on as we uh, add more to the temperatures as, as well for daytime highs, as well as the wind speed. So when I come back, I'll have more on your microclimate forecast, how warm it'll get today, very minimal because it's another cool down, but still some sunshine and plenty of it to last through your day, and then your full seven-day forecast. All right, Lauren, back to you. Diane, thank you. 
Well, some Comic-Con tourists were in for sticker shock this weekend with reports of pedicab drivers charging more than usual. This comes as San Diego City Council is exploring a potential crackdown ordinance for pedicab drivers when it comes to price gouging and loud music. Jamie Chambers has that report. The Comic-Con crowd is mostly long gone, leaving San Diego's gas lamp quarter with memories of celebrity sightings, outrageous costume patrons, and most importantly, the buzzing animation splashed across downtown. It was good to see the vitality of the city. Just 24 hours later, the petty cab riders say they are already missing the crowds. I like it. It's the most fun, especially Comic-Con. Well, the costumes is way enjoyable. With Comic-Con in the rearview mirror, the city and the Gruntled residents are once again focusing on petty cabs they say are causing problems downtown. Disco music blaring, hip hop music blaring, people on the petty cabs making all kinds of noise. Two at three in the morning in a residential district, not right. Pedicab riders say the city is regulating their industry, constantly trying to kill the vibe. I feel like getting rid of the music is um just kind of like. I feel like it's going to really decrease from the fun factor that happens down here. But some people have also complained about being gouged by petty cab riders who might not give the price prior to the ride. Sean Swift says these riders are giving his industry a bad name. Swift is even thinking about putting a sign on his pedicab that says, I don't charge crazy like the other guys. The city is kicking around the idea of creating a uniform price in order to build trust with tourists. Swift says he hopes they don't have any major changes but admits he'd like to see bad actors reined in. That's a relationship that'll take a while to uh, probably you know, like turn around, but I mean, it could be done. Jamie Chambers, KUSI News. Jamie, thank you. Well, President Joe Biden is pushing a plan to reform the Supreme Court. Details on the president's plan, why he says this court needs term limits. And we are quickly approaching Election Day with less than 100 days to go. Both sides are sharpening their attacks. The latest from the campaign trail when we come back on Good Morning San Diego. KUSI Weather brought to you by Renovation Realty. Don't take a low cash offer for your home. Call us today for a free consultation.